Today, we're going to talk about queer horror. Queer horror is the name of a genre or subgenre of literature that few people ever discuss. And while the term is prevalent, I've heard it used primarily to describe certain kinds of film. And in fact, the first time I heard the term queer horror referring to a body of literature was in an episode of the sketch comedy show Portlandia. <laughs> And in the sketch, it features two feminist bookstore owners who are discussing with an intern the most effective way of organizing their bookstore. And at the suggestion uh, that it's simpler to have everything organized by author's last name, they protest and they say that they already have their store organized by genre. And they then point to their queer horror section as an example. The joke being that it's such a esoteric, unheard of genre, meaning their organizing system is just hopeless and convoluted. But this got me thinking, you know, does queer horror exist as a prolific genre of literature? And if so, why is no one talking about it? Because in all honesty, my point of view is not only that there is a plethora of horror fiction works that deal primarily with sexuality and gender, and sexuality and gender being in and of themselves extremely horrific and problematic subject matter, depending on who you ask. But more than more so than this, my argument is that horror itself is inherently sexual. Queer themes are much more prolific in the genre than you may think, and horror's focus on monstrosity and chaos often leads to discussions on rebellion, abnormality, instability, and the other. Uh, philosophical home, it shares directly with things like queer theory and LGBTQ plus studies. I decided to make this video for three big reasons. Two of them are described in the title. I will give you information about this body of literature and how to approach it, followed up by recommendations of works that I personally found important and impactful. Um, however, when dealing with such a relatively new and potentially undefined genre, I will also have to give you some introduction, definition, and justification as to what queer horror is, what it aims to do, and the contentious nature of giving such a moniker to certain works that came about before the term even existed. So first, I want to explain the term queer itself when referring to queer horror. The word queer is still highly controversial. And just the fact that it's in my title might get me in some trouble with YouTube censorship policies, but I, th I do think it's important to include it. So queer literally means odd and strange, but it has been used more prolifically as an insult to gay and bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming people. And in fact, one could argue that queer was the first umbrella term ever used to refer to LGBTQ plus people in general, albeit, of course, in an extremely derogatory and disdainful way. Over the years, though, the term has been reclaimed by many LGBTQ plus activists and scholars as a descriptor of their identity, their activism, their body of literary, critical, and philosophical works. And of course, it's what the Q in LGBTQ stands for. But do keep in mind a lot of LGBTQ people still find this term offensive and going around calling people queer is not something you should do without discussing it with them first because it's still perceived as an insult by many people. However, many people are comfortable with the term either as a fitting, all-encompassing term for people who don't really feel like they fit into any other uh, categories or as an alternative to those who might view identifying as gay or bisexual as problematic for any other reason. As to its usage when referring to a body of literature, I view queer horror as an appropriate term first because of the literal definition of the name. Uh, indeed, with such a long history of weird and sensational tales in its repertoire, horror is very queer indeed. But a more <laughs> relevant reason to use the term queer is due to the rise of activism and literary criticism over the last few decades that has aimed to queer up reading and writing strategies, all in favor of redefining literature and philosophy of the past and present and unveil how it truly relates to gender, sexuality, and identity. You know, queer theory, feminist studies, LGBTQ plus studies, gender theory, they're all relatively new fields of studies that emerged sometime around the 70s and some didn't really even gain traction 
until the 80s and 90s. For horror, this means both producing a new body of literary work that addresses these issues directly, as well as reevaluating older works which may have dealt with LGBTQ plus issues in a direct or indirect way, and stating the significance and purpose of these works as it pertains to our understanding of gender and sexuality today. The argument can be made, and it is an argument I subscribe to, that queer horror has been around for centuries, and it actually first had broader cultural awareness uh, sometime around the turn of the 19th century, when transgressive and provocative literature in general were building up a storm in Europe with primarily French and Gothic influences. The works of Oscar Wilde, for example, in the opinion of many, are seminal pieces of queer fiction, and nothing represents a queer horror as viscerally and daringly, in my opinion, as Wilde's masterpiece, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, first published in 1890, uh, and then published in, its, in all its controversial, uncensored, obscene glory in 1891, I think the book grapples with a lot of neurotic and homoerotic elements, and it's hard to read the text as anything else. The plot involves a man who seeks to live a licentious and free life at the expense of his image, given that his body remains uh, intact, yet a painting made in his likeness starts to rot away instead. The closeted subtext is unignorable. You know, it's about a man who is hiding his vices away from view in the form of the picture until it can no longer remain hidden, aka a closeted gay man. That brings up something that is crucial to understanding about queer horror. A lot of queer horror hides in the subtext. It hides between the lines. Homosexuality is often relegated to suggestion and interpretation. Being openly gay or trans has been a dangerous existence throughout history, and in many parts of the world it still is. Thus, many authors may indeed create queer fiction, but could only do so through symbol and allegory. Yet a lot of it, I think, is easily recognizable if you know what to look for. And sadly, critics and bigots are as keen to it as those seeking to celebrate it. In fact, most of the harsh criticism and censorship the book received at the time it was published was homophobic in nature, and personal attacks were made against Wilde's character, despite the fact that Dorian Gray contains much more overt heterosexual decadence than homoerotic. For instance, at the time of its publishing, London's Daily Chronicle called it, quote, a tale spawned from the leprous literature of the French decadence, a poisonous book, the atmosphere of which is heavy with the mephitic odor of moral and spiritual putrefaction, a gloating study of the mental and physical corruption of fresh, fair, and golden youth, which might be fascinating, but for its effeminate frivolity, its studied insincerity, its theatrical cynicism, its tawdry mysticism, its flippant philosophizings, etc., etc. Homing in on words like effeminate, theatrical, etc., we come to understand that this critique, although highlighting vice in general, is clearly portraying Wilde's offenses as being queer in nature. I think this analysis answers to the constant criticisms that queer horror often receives as an ideation. People are often off-put by or dubious of queer horror as a valid, sensible, or helpful representation of queer identities because so much of its focus is on the violence, deviancy, and monstrousness that the queer characters portrayed either partake in or come to embody, which many might view as offensive, dangerous LGBTQ representations. The truth is, however, that queer horror does not choose these themes as central to its composition because it's trying to portray queer characters as vicious, vile sex maniacs, though I can completely understand why at the surface level it might seem that way. In order to read queer horror, I think we need to understand that these themes are so central to the genre because they are so central to the judgments, violence, and attacks that queer people in general face. And often, the existence which queer people are relegated to. Indeed, some of the works that I will recommend to you later on are considered queer horror simply because of the problematic and outdated representations of queer people which they contain. However, if we understand the history of queer people, such as Oscar Wilde, who was tried and imprisoned for his homosexuality, we know that queer people have historically been considered dangerous, monstrous, and deviant creatures simply by existing and doing nothing else. 
Homosexuality was considered a mental illness in the US much more recently than you probably think, for example. If you read queer horror, you must understand that often these negative stereotypical portrayals of queer identities are the only weapons and voices queer people have at their disposal after centuries of cultural destruction, basically. If we look to writers like Ralph Ellison and James Baldwin, we can understand how this embracing of monstrosity can actually be construed to be an empowerment of the self against a society that rejects one's otherness in favor of normativity. Black and queer authors have shown us historically that self-acceptance of one's otherness often leads to the reevaluation and understanding that it is indeed normativity and not queerness which is monstrous and cruel. Baldwin, in his own review of The Exorcist, for instance, which is published in his book on film criticism, The Devil Finds Work, saw the upright, elite, and powerful heteronormative class as the true source of the demonic evil which plagues the film, but which goes largely unaddressed. In his review, he writes, and I quote, I have seen the devil by day and by night, and I have seen him in you and in me. In the eyes of the cop and the sheriff and the deputy, the landlord, the housewife, the football player. In the eyes of some junkies, the eyes of some preachers, the eyes of some governors, presidents, wardens. In the eyes of some orphans and in the eyes of my father and in my mirror. And then he goes on to say, the devil does not need any dogma or justification since most normativity is his own inventions. And then he gives a powerful quote that basically says, one who has been treated as the devil recognizes the devil when they meet. This last sentence is incredibly potent in phrasing the aim of the queer horror body of literature. To articulate this idea that horror that the horror we feel is not necessarily present in the atrocities we witness, but is fabricated by our own prejudices around these atrocities, which might not be atrocities at all, and that these prejudices are the true horror that's at work. The monsters of queer horror may well be queer themselves, but only to highlight either the realms in which they are enclosed and entrapped, or to contrast their relative tameness when compared to the horrors of the lawful and normal forces which aim to oppress them. So the main takeaway points from everything that I just said can be summarized as this. One, uh, queer horror has been around for a long time, although it has only been recently referred to by that name. Uh, two, queer horror is the exploration of sexuality and gender in a monstrous sense, with the purpose of revealing hidden truths about our own moral standings and perceptions of otherness. Number three, um, Oscar Wilde was an amazing Irish diva, and you should read his works. <laughs> and number four, don't judge queer horror if it is hypersexual or hyperviolent. Instead, read between the lines and try to figure out for yourself why it is so. And the realization that you have is often profound and powerful. Now, without further ado, I want to delve into five queer horror books that I think anyone interested in uncovering their genre should read. First, I want to recommend the seminal work of queer horror. This book has mystified and captivated audiences for decades upon decades. Of course, it's Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu, published in his collection In a Glass Darkly. Um, first published in 1872, this vampire story actually precedes Dracula by a couple of decades and introduces staple vampire tropes that are still prevalent today. Um, the titular female vampire, for example, cannot enter a home without being invited. She becomes more powerful during the night, refuses to partake in prayer, all tropes that are still used in vampire stories today. More than this, however, it is famously the first representation of lesbian vampires in Western media. The story follows a young girl named Laura, who receives the mysterious visitor Carmilla into her home. The two strike a friendship, and the two love each other very much, initially in a platonic sort of way. Uh, slowly, her peculiar behavior, uh, Carmilla's, uh, makes Laura suspect that she may indeed be an undead being that is yearning to drink her blood and kill her. However, far from being a typical tale of victimhood and murder, there are various passages in which Carmilla declares her love for Laura in a sincere and romantic way, or as sincere as rom and romantic as the time it was written in allowed. It may just be me, but besides the fact that Carmilla is a vampiric creature who threatens to take Laura's life, 
their lesbian romance is never quite condemned as you would expect it to be. There is a lot of sexual imagery involved in the plot as well, with Carmilla always seeming to suck her victim's blood through her through their breasts, which really lives little to the imagination. Knowing that the popularity of, of vampire literature saw its beginnings in a tale of ardent and passionate lesbian love just makes me really happy. <laughs> uh, if And if only to see the juggling act between horrific imagery and monstrosity juxtaposed with gay love, this is definitely a must read for anyone interested in seeing how queer horror uh, has been around for centuries indeed. Uh, to me, it makes sense that vampires were popularized by queer literature because vampires just seem to be inherently sexual creatures. Something about like their mysterious, almost camp allure, the exchange of body fluids, you know, I'm all for that. Up next, I am going to recommend a very controversial piece of fiction as it pertains to LGBTQ plus studies. And indeed, many arguments can be made as to whether this book is detrimental or essential in reading queer literature. It's this contentiousness and controversy, however, that compels me to recommend it, whatever school of thought you subscribe to. This is Psycho by Robert Block, first published in 1959. Um, as much as we all love to talk about Alfred Hitchcock's adaptation, I will leave discussion of the film out of this because I think the novel merits its own analysis, which I feel it seldom gets. By the way, I cannot possibly discuss the queer themes in this novel without majorly spoiling the ending. Um, I think we're all familiar with the story of Psycho, but I believe those who aren't need to be protected <laughs> at all costs, because it is a rare treat to experience such a twist while knowing nothing about it. So if you do not know the plot of the story, please stop watching. The novel follows Norman Bates, an alcoholic single man who runs a motel along with his overbearing mother. Soon we learn that his mother actually has been dead for years, and her appearances in the story have actually been Norman impersonating her while in a deep state of psychosis. Uh, he dons women's clothing and he goes around chopping off women's heads. It's great. <laughs> um, a flurry of sex-oriented themes emerge from this mother-son dynamic. Of course, the most obvious is the Oedipal relationship between Norman and his mother prior to him murdering her, as well as her role in metaphorically castrating her son and the absence of a father figure in Norman's life, which the book implies is one of the sources behind his eventual psychosis. A central piece of it all, and perhaps the most iconic image associated with Bloch's novel and Hitchcock's film, is the fact that Norman Bates is a crossdresser and he switches gender identity and presentation in the midst of his psychotic episodes. Cross-dressing and transgenderism are represented in the novel as dangerous symptoms of his maniacal murderous spree, and not surprisingly since homosexuality and transgenderism, as I said before, were considered mental illnesses at the time that this novel was written. And hell, they still are by many, many people. Calling back to Oscar Wilde's influences, it is also uncovered that Norman Bates was an avid reader of occult satanic literature, and of course, the depraved writings of the French decadent the Marquis de Sade, a detail that is curiously absent from the film. The novel thus portrays Norman Bates as the consequence of a man leading a life void of masculinity and rife with hypersexual and occult fixations thus equating evil with homosexuality in a remarkably interesting, if not deeply offensive way. Robert Bloch's intentions behind portraying Norman Bates as a psychotic cross-dresser may have well been played simply to shock readers, yet I cannot ignore this book for being such a powerful symptom of its time and a sobering reminder of the representation homosexual and transgender people have historically received. Nonetheless, its implications on the meaning of masculinity, gender roles, and the culturally symptomatic nature of sexuality and gender in general make it a com very compelling yet rightfully controversial read. I urge anyone curious to read it to keep the context of queer horror in mind, for I do think it is important not to forget the exploitative nature of a lot of fiction like this. Norman Bates' gender and sexuality, in my opinion, should always be the focal point of the discussions around Bloch's novel, thus making it a staple in queer horror literature, whether we like it or not. Up next, I have a book that I love dearly. It is one of my favorite written works, and the prose in it is unlike anything else I've ever experienced. 
This is The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, first published in 1959. This novel shares its name with a popular Netflix series that came out recently. And although it was inspired by the novel, that series has little to do with the plot and characters of the book. So keep in mind all my words of praise for this novel are for the novel alone. Shirley Jackson is perhaps most known for her short story The Lottery, which most people read sometime in high school. The Lottery is known for its stark, tense tone and the terseness of its writing, uh, but it just speaks to Jackson's versatility as a writer, I think, because Hill House is replete with florid language, metaphysical descriptions, but most important, it's a painfully human portrait of a desperately lonely woman. The story centers around a paranormal investigator who invites three people uh, to stay in and explore Hill House, which is supposedly the epicenter of psychic and paranormal phenomena. Although set up as a ghost story, the ambiguity of it all is perhaps its most iconic aspect. Not only do we start questioning whether there are ghosts at all in Hill House, but most importantly, we begin to question the sanity and the stability of our main character, Eleanor Vance. Eleanor, among those invited to live in Hill House, is a lonely single woman hint, hint, <laughs> who chooses to sign up to the study, not because of any interest in paranormal phenomena, but because she longs for any purpose or meaning at all in her otherwise highly repressed life. While in Hale House, she meets a fellow study subject named Theo. Theo is a free and wild woman who Eleanor immediately admires, and the two strike a rather intimate friendship, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, nothing explicitly sexual is ever described between the two, yet their longing for each other is evident in the many conversations they have, fantasizing about living together in close intimacy. Uh, they're constantly seeking each other's company, holding hands, uh, the warmth of their relationship and companionship sort of being a contrast against the vastness and coldness of Hill House. Whether or not paranormal activity actually escalates within Hill House as the novel progresses, uh, it is evident that Eleanor's mental state deteriorates, and a big factor behind her breakdown that not a lot of people talk about is that she feels depressed because Theo will eventually leave her side. Jackson's novel, I think, is a monumental example of queer horror because it allows us to explore the psyche of a potentially lesbian woman, which Jackson herself never refuted her being, and it also allows us to peek into that loneliness and repression that sadly permeate a lot of the queer experience. Relegating ghosts and psychic phenomena to the realm of interiority also makes this such an intriguing and disquieting novel, and it makes Eleanor one of the most compelling and tragic characters that I have ever lived through vicariously in literature. To me, the prose and the story are absolutely phenomenal, and this to me is a necessary read not just for anyone interested in queer horror, but anyone who wants to experience the emotional power that horror in general possesses. Next, I am recommending uh, Cabal by Clive Barker. This was first published in 1988. Clive Barker is, of course, most famous for his Books of Blood series and his novella The Hellbound Heart, which he himself adapted into a film uh, called Hellraiser, starring everyone's favorite S&M leather daddy, Pinhead. Clive Barker is an openly gay author, and while some of his writing still suffers from this closeted subtext syndrome, meaning that few of his characters are openly gay and so on, his imagination and his ability to metaphorically write about the queer experience is so unique and wonderful. Cabal is basically a story of Boone, a man who is erroneously accused of murder, and we follow his journey trying to escape authorities. And after he is fatally shot by cops, he resurrects as a monster. And he finds refuge in a paradise land known as Minion, located in an abandoned graveyard which is inhabited by monsters called the Nightbreed. He's chased around mostly by his psychiatrist, Decker, who is the actual killer who's been trying to frame Boone. Barker describes Boone as an undead James Dean lookalike who fucks like a tiger, which I think is a sentence that speaks for itself. Boone, uh, who eventually becomes part of the undead, uh, is obviously portrayed as a sexually and morally appealing character despite becoming a monster. Barker described this story on various occasions as the battle between 19th and 20th century monsters, uh, the mystical otherworldly creatures versus the modern serial killer type. 
To read some of his own words on the subject, quote, The 20th century monster is perfectly embodied by the psychotic, soulless serial killer. When I talk about the 19th century monsters, I think I use them without a trace of the pejorative. The world-weary vampire and the shapeshifter are figures that have a shamanistic power. They are images that are associated with the demoniacal because we give them that place in society. I'm not entirely convinced that they would be considered monsters in any healthy society. They would be seen simply as extensions of our appetite, extensions of what is fantastical and extraordinary. Furthermore, when describing the character of Decker, the main villain, uh, echoing Baldwin's words from earlier, actually, he says, quote, Do we actually like these people? Not only Decker, but the normal human beings who make up the lynch mob. Do we really prefer these machismo spouting bastards to the strange and the mysterious and the extraordinary? Here, Barker's acutely drawing the distinction between the fantastic and extraordinary versus the patriarchal and masculine. And thus, I think the dichotomy in Cabal between monsters and humans is given an obvious queer flavor. To me, what makes this story so powerful is that the monsters he portrays are so profusely queer-coded, yet they are benign representations of this queer coding. They are portrayed as fantastic, humorous, and noble creatures set directly against a toxic and vicious world of masculine authority, uh, primarily that of law enforcement and, of course, medicine, given that the main villain is a doctor. Would it be too far to even say that Barker might be taking a stab against the field of medicine and how harmful and vicious it has historically been against LGBTQ people? I don't think so. This fantasy story to me is fun, inventive, but above all, it's such a loving portrayal of monsters who are suffused in queer characteristics turning on its head the morality and prejudice set in stories like Psycho. If you want to start reading Clive Barker's work, I will say that this is a great start, for it certainly belongs to the horror genre. Uh, yet a lot of it also delves into fantasy fiction, which he is also prolific in. Lastly, I am going to recommend a book that I read very recently, uh, was very conflicted by, but ultimately I decided that it was a re rewarding yet very disturbing read. Um, this is Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright, first published in 1996. Poppy Z. Bright is the pseudonym of Billy Martin, a trans gay author who has outspokenly written about the gay and trans experience since the 80s. Um, this novel is strange, to say the least. It reads like a splatter movie, you know, like a, the concept of like an exploitation flick, but the writing is beautiful. The descriptions are haunting, but the language I could even describe as being delicate and picturesque. Um, this story is basically about the meeting of two serial killers who long to torture their victims sexually and physically, and they find the perfect victim in the form of a young teenager named Tran, who one of the killers eventually starts to develop feelings for. But our main character is Lucas, a man who's been diagnosed with HIV and who had ended his relationship with Tran prior to him being kidnapped by the killers. And the third act of the novel follows Lucas's deteriorating health as he journeys to try and rescue Tran. The novel unpacks a lot of things, I think a lot of tragic and emotional baggage that is still sadly carried by the LGBTQ plus community to this day. And I think that it's quite different from all the other works that I've talked about previously, mainly in that it features unequivocally gay characters, which is sadly a rare sight in horror. Initially, you might be compelled to judge it negatively because of its portrayal of gay men as cannibalistic, Jeffrey Dahmer-like serial killers. However, their perversity is only a single facet of the novel's internal conflict, with most of it actually centering around Lucas, who is also gay, but he's not a serial killer, and his own struggles come to light with HIV and interpersonal relationships. To me, this is an exemplary post-HIV novel, and the most grueling conflict in it stems from Lucas's struggle with this disease and the judgments of the world. The horror and hyperviolence of the novel, to me, read mainly as a consequence of the vulnerability and emotional turmoil that living as a gay man in the 90s must have been. This is what I mean when I say these hypersexual, hyperviolent representations are mostly just due to the living conditions and societal ostracizing that queer people have faced. To me, the horror only helps to elevate the central romances and existential conundrums that the characters in here face. And I reiterate that this is a beautiful piece of fiction. I am in no way 
excusing or glamorizing the violence that is portrayed in the novel. Yet, my point is that I don't think the author is either. In the end, this is a novel about people who are, who are hurting. And if we can't write about hurting and pain viscerally and unflinchingly, then we cannot do the queer experience justice. This book blew me completely away. I have never read anything like it. And honestly, I can't wait to read some of the author's other works. Well, there you have it. Those are my explanations and recommendations um, of queer horror literature. I hope you enjoyed the video and have developed newfound interest in the genre. Or at the very least, you are now aware that queer horror exists and that it is very valid. Um, if any of you have any other recommendations for additional thoughts on the subject matter, I would love to hear it in the comments. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope everyone keeps doing well. And I will see you in my next video. I have many ideas and I'm already working on them. So stay tuned. So long. And by the way, um, Cthulhu says gay rights.